Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baghurst, and my guest today, I'm very excited to have Mark Bennett on the show. Mark is a coach expert, coach developer, uh, all things coaching. Mark, believe it or not, I've heard your name on many occasions, whether it be on my show or, or on somebody else's show. So it's wonderful to have you on here. If you wouldn't mind, just give us a little bit of background of, of how you got into coaching and then coach development. The short version, Tim, I take it on that. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me on. So the, the short version is I was um, I joined the British Army in 1983, thinking everyone would be very fit and motivated. Um, and that was not the case. So I got into a bit of trouble. And uh, then I linked into a commando soldier who really took me on and saw me who was, who was I am and not just as others saw me. And he took me under his wing and uh, that, that was kind of the first connection with actually how someone interacts with me impacts my behaviors and my commitment. So I went down did the commando course, ended up being a physical training instructor. After the first golf conflict with the commandos, I then got promoted into a gymnasium where we were training recruits. And obviously, with the egos you are as a young physical training instructor, commando trained, I thought I was very good at my job. And you had 10 weeks to train recruits. And at the end of 10 weeks, you had um, physical endurance tests, log race, obstacle course competition, etc. And you could do what you wanted with them at that time in the early 90s. And my platoon used to win every single competition. And I thought I was doing a great job. And then on one of the pass off parades in the early 90s, one of the parents came up to me and said, you've really changed my son's life. He doesn't stop talking about you. And a negative light bulb went off like a train hit me. And I'd, I'd also then in that moment, although she said that as a positive, I connected with, I'd also impacted the life of every recruit that had not passed in. And then I consciously looked to the numbers of all the platoons every 10 weeks for a good 18 months. And my platoons in the total number passing out were quite low. And it was kind of a realization that instead of me thinking I was great at my job, for me, my perception was actually I wasn't great at all. For people that had the mental resilience, people that connected to what I was doing kept up and they passed out. But how much was I influencing the people that maybe didn't have that mental resilience, didn't have that connection, that self-awareness, that decision making that you need to develop? So at that moment, I decided I need to either change what I did or change the way I did it. And I went on this journey of exploration. There was no Internet. Um, there was no you know, I didn't go to libraries. I didn't know of anybody that was doing anything like it. So I started to experiment. I knew what I was doing was wrong. I just didn't know what was right. Uh, I started to lose some of the competitions. So you can imagine my staff that always wanted me as their physical training instructor, because there was many, started to say, Mark, you're going soft. You know, this isn't the way. But I knew I couldn't go back. So I knew I had to go forward. So after about another eight months or so, I started to win all the competitions again. Bar one, by the way, it still haunts me today. Um, but all, all of the competitions, there's three or four each pass off. But the numbers were bigger. So I started to realize then I was onto something. Now, I couldn't explain it to anyone, but I knew consciously what I was doing differently. But if someone said, Mark, what are you doing differently? I couldn't explain it. I certainly couldn't train anyone else. And then I got promoted and ended up running the commando training wing um, later on, a few years later. And I started to connect with... Um, people, I was going away doing coaching courses where there were master classes where coaches from elite sport would come. And it was a super league team. And I said, uh, rugby league. And they said, Mark, you know, we're really struggling to get people to work together. Can you come and do something with us in pre-season? So I said, yeah, of course I can, but it's not what you're going to expect. So in that moment, I started to get real impact within five days of, of, connecting players together in the mental resilience, in the understanding, the empathy, the decision-making, not just physical fatigue, which they probably thought that's what they were going to get. Now, the next light bulb came as a negative, where three or four weeks later, uh, a legend of a rugby league player called Alan Langer, captained Australia Rugby League, Brisbane Broncos. And he said, Mark, you need to get back up here. It's all gone bad again. It's gone back to where it was. So I thought, hang on a minute. This is going to be no good at all if people are relying on me to be there to develop them. So I needed then to go, well, actually, if it's going to be any good, I need to constantly know what I'm doing in a way to share it with other coaches 
And can I make myself redundant? Can I develop the coaches in a way so when I'm not there, mm. I've improved their judgment, the way they're listening, the way they're communicating and influence. So it took another six years of development, but I was getting better and better. And it took me, um, I'm still evolving now, but I think it took six years to really nail it down. And then the shortened version is since then, I turned down promotion in the military um, to commit to this full time. I've worked with over 30 sports now, from grassroots up to Paralympic champions, uh, Olympians, professional teams across elite sports globally, international professional teams, also corporate sector. And I've gone into schools as well, often in rough neighborhoods to help the teachers understand how to develop and connect with kids. So it's pretty much been a spectrum. Um, and that's kind of the short version. Um, along that way, there've been other light bulbs of actually understanding a lot of time when people bring me in, the person that brings me in is often the source of the issue. So mm. especially in senior management where they're, trying, they're micromanaging people because they have invisible expectations. So there is an evolution of understanding. I can't go in hard, but actually I need them to understand what their need is and not what their want is. And often that's a journey of self-discovery that I can help accelerate. Well, before we get going into the questions, if anybody's watching and does have a question for Mark, just put it in your chat box, your comment section, wherever you're watching from, and we'll try to get it to him. So, Mark, given what you've learned so far, and it is a continual journey, I think we all agree the more we know, the more we realize how little we know. Yeah. When we, we look at coaching as a whole, where where are the gaps in coach education that if you could go in and you, our master's degree, for example, what would we need to be including that, are, that is so often missing from coach education, coach training, workshops, clinics, you name it? There's two massive elements. One is, and I believe you had Stuart Armstrong on recently, and I think he may have used these words, but understanding the tangibles in software, the tangibles identifying the source of a software, so judgment in impacting coach interventions, and the adherence element to support change in a coach, as opposed to just going on a training course, and then within two, three weeks, they've reverted back to where they were. So for me, they are the two key elements that's missing in, in much of the coach development, if indeed it's there at times. Can you give an example of, of what you mean by that? Because some coaches may not know what you're referring to. So give us an example of, is this a, a, a long-term process? Is this a coach working or a mentor working with coaches over six months, a year? Uh, what would that look like for you? It would be very dependent on the situation. Uh, if you look, and also the individual, um, there will be individuals that will say, I need your help. Um, you know, I don't know the answers, but I know I'm not getting what I want. So within those journeys, it can be within three months, they're really self-sufficient in what they're doing. I, I, I build up peer support groups so much to it, which we may get into. But the, the key element, if we're looking at understanding software in particular, is often, and I'm generalizing here, but the vast majority of coaching courses are in the hardware, within the physical, technical, mm -hmm. tactical. Often they might look at a psychologist to go, well, actually, they deal with mood, motivation. But if you break down any team, let's take basketball, basketball for an example. If you look at where the errors often come from, where a coach on the sideline is getting very irate or frustrated because they're thinking, we did this in practice, but why can't it transfer into the match? Often when you start breaking it down, it's either a state, a scanning off and on ball, a identifying options in the game IQ, a judgment of the influences of an option, i.e. human capability, variables in team and opposition, and then committing to the choice and then evaluating the choice and the execution live without the need for a stop and a chat. All of that is software. And if you look at most teams, that is not explicitly taught to the athletes in a way that can help accelerate their judgment to give them confidence on making the right choice and reviewing it live to know what to continue to do and what to adjust. All of that is are the software traits. And I haven't met a coach yet that when you start breaking it down, there's no light bulbs that are going off. Every coach so far has go, ah, yeah, that's what I struggle with. I struggle with that element within this particular athlete or my players. 
And that's where I call it coach enhancement. That's where most coaches I work with at all levels have enough technical, tactical knowledge for the teams they're working with. Where they really struggle is how can I influence the judgment and decision making live and make myself redundant as a coach so we don't have athletes looking over to the coach? Was that what you wanted me to do, coach? So that's the software element. And then there's a support change process that in an organization, so a whole team, could take six months to a year if they're in season under pressure, especially the big teams, NBA, Major League Baseball, Premiership Football, etc., soccer. So you can get a change very quickly once you, you know that old saying, team, you don't know what you don't know. So often one of the challenges I have, often if I was to score, which I don't, there's a strategy I use, but if I was to score coaches of where do you see yourself in your coaching, often it's a seven to 10 out of 10. Now, once we start the intervention early on, most of the time that score will drop to three or four out of 10. Now the awareness is there. So you've got to prepare them for that and then really nail down like anything in developing change in someone. What is the most important? What's the most impactful? Well, let's agree what that looks like. Let's support that. Let's set some what I call UAEs around it. Unacceptable, acceptable, exceptional. Let's set the support group up. Let's set an evaluation process in the moment up and then let's agree how I can support you and the permissions you're going to give me to challenge you if you don't do what you agree. Now, <clears throat> I, I'm thinking this from the perspective of, of private coaches. Okay. In, in the US, we have a lot of club coaches. We have a lot of private coaches, etc. cetera, um, getting away from the college teams and the, the professional teams where the their success on or off the field, gymnasium, wherever, is often determining whether they get a job or keep their job or whether they make money. In addition, when, when those coaches are considered, many parents or those surrounding those athletes or even the athletes themselves expect that coach to be very busy on the sidelines because that's how they quote earn their living, and I know I don't know if you know Doug uh, Lamov, who uh, he he was on my show and he talked about how some coaches may be very active on the sidelines, and the perception is they must be a very good coach because they saved the game and and won it for them, versus the coach who may do very little on the sideline because they've done so much in practice that they don't need to. How do you, how do you, I, I guess, encourage those coaches f- to transition from being hectic, busy, doing all this coaching in the environment because that's the expectation of society versus teaching athletes to coach themselves and understand decision making themselves so that they are able to um, to perform when necessary without that coach intervention. I think it's a hard thing for most coaches to accept that I can just let my athletes do their thing. I think there's this, we could break down some critical elements in that answer to that question, Tim is, and if I went through the, the key elements of that is one is often coaches hide from everybody, why they're changing and the purpose of the change and the value. That's number one, the biggest mistake. So you need to share with your athletes. You need to identify who are the people of influence. And often that's parents. That's the boss. You know, who's paying the bills, who's hiring and firing, whoever it may be. So we put in a protocol where we need to identify, I call it a lighthouse, is, you know, why are we here? What's our purpose? What would success look like? And connect it. If we're looking at grassroots, we do this across the board. Connect the the correlation between the person and the player or the athlete with the people of influence, with the parents. So if we just went to parents on this. So you need to understand that first as a coach. What is a lighthouse? You know, what do I want to build them to? What's the ideal? If I could, what would I see in here if I walked into a practice session or a match? You know, what would be the dream? So then you connect with, okay, so what are the behaviors you'd like to see in the athletes? But also then what are the behaviors you need in yourself And what are the behaviors that you need to make sure you share with the people of influence? So an example would be, we did this within England golf, which first place I met Stuart Armstrong as a funny old connection. 
we went in and when the parents turned up to drop the kids off, we asked them before they arrived if they could stay because we'd like to share with them, involve them into their their kids' journey. So all of a sudden we're getting by in now. Hang on a minute. Oh, they, they want to involve us. And then what we share to them is often traditional coaching is the the, the young kid that can make decisions because we're making decisions as soon as we decide what color we like, what food we like, what toy we want to play with. And we experiment and explore as, a, as soon as we start to crawl. Often traditional coaching will shut that down because now we're stood listening to a coach shouting, being emotional. When if you think about what type of child do you want to develop, do you want someone confident to make decisions, to communicate, to have empathy, to be able to problem solve life? So one of the things you're going to notice within our coaching, this is what we'd share to the parents is, we're going to develop that within your children. So you may see me not shouting the actor as much as you may have before, but this is what I'd need you to look for so you can spot what's happening. So we start to then use examples. Now, there are, if you go on my YouTube channel or in my membership area, there's video clips of this happening. Uh, South African soccer kids speaking to parents before a match, walking up to the spectators and saying, thanks for coming. Um, let me share with you our success for this game. This is what it would look like. This is what you, you can look for. This is how you can support us. We'd appreciate if you didn't do this because that's helping, not helping us with the success. Not from a coach, from the players. So the more we do this early on, the easier it is to get the buy-in and the support. Now, let me spin that for you, Tim, of when it didn't happen. So we had an England golf and I was uh, coaching the England golfing team, the amateurs. And we said to one of the, well, I said to all the coaches, but we shared with them, you need to make sure if you're changing your behavior, you meet, need to win the hearts and minds of the people of influence. So in this occasion, it would have been parents. So they all did it by one coach. And so the one coach developed their coaching. So now instead of before what was happening was the parent was sat watching the lesson and imagining the driving range. And as soon as the, the, the child, the player, finished the swing, the coach would be sharing, yeah, I love that. And don't forget you need to do this and hold the grip and get your swing into there. And then there's a little video and let me point out these things to you and the player's nodding. So once he started to learn the craft of developing decision-making awareness in the player, he was obviously saying a lot less. We were using a principle of player first, player last. So as soon as now the, the, the player had finished the completion, the player then says, commit yes or no. So the, the rule is if you don't commit, you can't review because the conclusion is just commit next time. So if it's a yes, this is what I did. This was a difference. This is what I changed, if anything, in a very simple way based on what success of that swing or that movement was. The coach is now listening. Now the coach just opens the video they just recorded. Coach still doesn't say anything. You go, watch this. Do you still think the same? So now the player's looking at it, and now we're getting a self-awareness thing. Oh, no, I didn't realize I was doing that. Now I'm seeing that. I think it's this. Only then would the coach either agree or go, well, actually, this is what I'm seeing. So because the coach didn't share the differences and the why, the parents stood up and stopped the session, pulled mm. the coach to the side and said, what am I paying you for? You're not doing anything. Now, all the other coaches that shared with the parents before, they were literally celebrating. Oh, my God, this is life changing for my child. I'm loving the engagement. I can see the difference because they knew what they were looking for. So for me, the number one is identify the people of influence and spend some time sharing, winning the hearts and minds of why we're doing what we do and the difference you'll notice and what you can look for. But the other thing is, if I'm changing, I need to share with the players, this is why I'm changing in the value. And this is my work on this week, month, whatever it is. This is how you can help me. So if a coach has recognized, I talk too much in timeouts. Every time we come in for a chat, I'm realizing now I'm spending two, three minutes stood talking to you. And I know you guys want to play. So one of the things is now is I'm going to make sure two minutes max, and I want you guys to go first and then... At the end, I want you guys to go last as well. So I'll just say, what have you committed to or what are we agreeing? Then you're going to speak and I'm not going to say anything. If I go over the two minutes or if I start adding stuff, you can say pineapple to me. And if you say pineapple to me, I'm going to step back. Now, the kids love it and they're like, oh, and now we're opening the connection. But also what it's showing is that a coach is explicitly saying, I'm not going to be great at this straight away. But I'm going to commit to it because when I do, this is going to be so helpful for both of us. So now we're role modeling when a child says, I can't do it. The coach says, yet. You can't do it yet. 
but I understand because I'm going through the same journey. How can we support each other? So they're, they're the, the key bits for me, Tim. Mm. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break and we're going to be back with Mark Bennett. Just a reminder, if you have questions, put them in your chat box. The mission of FSU Coach is to prepare and equip the next generation of coaches and sports professionals with best practices and current research to enable them to pursue excellence. We have two academic programs, the online graduate certificate, which is four classes, and also a 10 class master's in athletic coaching. Our graduate certificate and master's program can be started at any time, either the, the summer, fall, or spring. All of our classes have the word coach or coaching in them, and they're taught by coaches for coaches. The types of classes that we offer focus on the athlete as a whole person. We focus on the theory and practice, the research, the helping skills, uh, even some of the mental performance behind you know, what it goes into being an athlete. I came to FSU Coach because I truly believed in the mission and the purpose of the program. I think I have my dream job being a head coach at Florida State, but I know there's always more ways that I can help my athletes and better prepare as a coach, so I thought joining this master's program would help me um, learn different ways to uh, attack my job. If you're interested in going into coaching or joining the FSU Coach program, I would just say don't even think about it and do it. All right, we're back live with Mark. Mark, one of the things that you talked about in that golf example was the coach showing the athlete video of themselves. And one of the questions I've had burning for the last couple of weeks since we since we set this up is coaches themselves do not observe their own coaching very often. And in my experience, it's almost zero. And I come from a, a teacher education background where when I went through my PGC in England and Wales, I'll correct myself in Wales, observation was required all the time. We, we videoed ourselves, we had people come in and watch us, we got reports. And then I, I moved and transitioned into coaching and it was, what are you talking about? Observation of, of me coaching? It doesn't happen very much. Why not and why should it? My, my first intervention stage with anybody, once I've agreed to work with someone where I go, you need me and the relationship is starting in the way it needs to, is build self-awareness. So I say to everybody, there's no way I can share with you your first stage intervention if you don't recognize it yourself. Because one, you're not going to commit to it. And secondly, the self-awareness in the moment is where you know if you're doing something well or you need to adjust. So I get everyone to put a camera on their chest. With I'm working with um, the national uh, canoeing um, in in one of the uh, European countries at the moment. So they put it on their hat because they're in a side boat and they're looking. And all they do is I say, look, just put it on, put it on for enough sessions where everyone forgets it and you forget it. And just don't think, what does Mark want to see now? Just do you, just coach. And then once you've had a few, just pick one. Don't pick your best one, just pick a real one. And all I want you to do is watch through it. And I'm looking at take time notes. And the time notes will be, on what you're saying, how you're saying it, who's looking, what's the interaction like, um, what's happening after the intervention, and just put anything you think is great, and just bullet points, anything you think, ah, no, that's not great, and any question marks. And once they've gone through that, they send me the video with the notes, and I do the same. Now, organizationally, if there's three or four coaches, I buddy them up. Mm -hmm. So they would swap. And then they would look at each other's and put little comments. Then they would catch up for a Zoom or a coffee and have the notes in front of them and go through it. And I would do the same if somebody was working with me. So it doesn't have to be me. We can put in those support strategies. And every single time so far, so it's been over 30 years now, and I have, I'd say I've been doing the video for 20 of those, is I would say there hasn't been one coach that has not picked up, oh, my God, moments that they didn't realize they were doing things. And if you're not aware of it, how can you change? So let's establish reality. Let's not hide from it, because once we establish a reality, we can identify the need of the intervention and what priority one is. If we haven't done that, we're, we're literally clutching at straws. Are there common themes, consistencies across these observations of all of these coaches over the years where you go, yep, 
See this again. Here it is. Yeah, there's there's two uh, that that stand out. One is talking too much mm -hmm. uh, with no real player engagement. So we're talking, we're trying to get the answer out of a that we want to hear. And we're just guiding it so much. And we're, we're throwing on, if we looked at digits of data, we're throwing 9, 10, 11 digits of data at an athlete and hoping it will just go in like some computer. Um, so that's number one. The second one is we're not scanning for after action agreement. So because of the, too much talking, there isn't really an agreement. And there's so it's just kind of a lot of nodding. But then once that's happened, if we looked at basketball, soccer, American football, all these type of sports, for example, once that intervention in practice or even in a match, what we should be looking at is now is, OK, so what have we agreed is a clarity? Often we realize there's not. But I'm looking for now, are they committing to what we've agreed? Whether it's coming off or not, that's not important. Are they committing to what they said they were going to commit to? Now, there's only one reason why they shouldn't is if they immediately, the position have made an adjustment and they're consciously not doing what we agree because they're seeing a better option. But as soon as they come in, this is the, the second mistake linked into the same. What we should be doing is next time out in practice, the first thing should happen is, do we commit to what we agree? Because we need to connect. They shouldn't be separate. If the answer is no, then we quantify, okay, why not? It's not a telling off. We need, we're need we inquisitive now. So they may quantify why, but 99.9% of the time when we start this is they, they won't remember what it is or they're guessing. They're kind of, you know, they're not specific. And that's down to the coach over talking, no real clarity of agreement, and they're not scanning for action. So I, I use an old saying that I use so often is, don't tell me, show me. So, you know, when a, a, an example, not delving too deep, Tim, if you say, Mark, you're going too deep, just pineapple me. But one of the elements is, is if um, if something's happened, and this, this is another common trait with a lot of teams and athletes, something will be going wrong, i.e. Wrong, wrong choice or wrong execution, or it may be they've recognized they're not scanning. So we're at that stage already. They come in, your coach even says, right, talk to me review and they will tell the coach all the right answers oh we didn't do this next time we should do this and the coach goes wow this is brilliant no what should be happening is the coach's response should be when did you recognize that let's wait for the answer and then what did you do about it because don't tell me the answer show me the answer so if you recognize you need a change i'm giving you permission now to commit to the change I don't mind if it comes off or not, but you're now recognizing something isn't working and you're committing to a different choice. So please don't come in. Tell me what you should have done if you haven't committed to it. Now, that in itself is quite a paradigm shift for a lot of coaches. Hmm. One of the, the challenges that I have as a coach, and I think many do, is, is transitioning what we do in practice into a performance where the environment changes there is pressure. There is uh, an opponent who is trying to do everything to stop us doing what we have been learning in practice. And for, for me, this is a, a continual battle where my, my coaching has changed over, over the past few years from being drill oriented, let's make you look good. And then you go away and hopefully do well in a performance, but you're happy with my coaching because yep. I'm showing you success to one where you are uncomfortable. It's frustrating. Uh, you are, you are going through growth because I want you to be able to adapt in the, the game situation. That's been a struggle for me as a coach to transition to that, but also for the, the clients or the athletes who who want a good practice. They want the feel good of, of I did well today. And for private coaches, that's hard because that, that client may not come back because they're not having the, the enjoyment. Do you have any suggestions or guidelines for, for coaches to translate what you're doing in practice so that it actually works in the game? Because we happen so often We've worked on this all week. 
why are you not now doing it in the game? Right. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that expression from a coach and how do we fix that or what do we do about it? So there's a few elements to this answer sure. as well. Tim. So first thing is, if we're looking at from elite level performance to grassroots, we've got to make sure we agree what success is in the first place. So if the success is engagement, enjoyment, then that's going to be very different to we need to maximize our performance because we want to get results. So there's a variance difference there. The, the first element, I, I've broken up three different phases of practice that we explicitly share with the athletes and we plan for within our conversation, whether it's just us or other coaches. The first phase is learn it. The second phase is perform it. The third phase is challenge it. And it's non-linear, so it doesn't mean to say you go like this. It could be all of these. So the learn it is we can't do it yet. So that's something we're committing to things we can't yet do, and that there will be a lot more coach engagement there, but it's still where we can. There'll be opposition. There'll be choices if that's part of the match. But it's slow pace. You can, you, there's a lot more talking, connection, committing to things. But the success is we can't do it yet. So we're committing things we can't yet do. The next phase, once we go right, we're getting it now, is perform it. And that's more game, which could be half pitch, half court. And we're in game play now. And we're, we're looking for now, can we transfer what we've now learned in a performance type game? And we're looking for the transition. So if athletes then get caught up in just playing the game, we connect back to remind me what success is. And we've set UAs around what will be unacceptable, acceptable, exceptional. So they can reference back on that on many different intervention of timeouts down to a 10 second one. Once we're getting results there, that's potentially where most coaches go. I have a challenge it phase. So this is where athletes can go, coach, we're ready or, or coach can go, do you think we're ready? And then the coach's cap spins. So the coach now, the coach's role is to attempt to break now the tactics or the technical that we've just been believing that in perform it we can nail so the coach wouldn't then take opposition aside they go right i want you to do this see if you can do this and the coach is so the only goal is see can i break this down now can i find a weak link and that's the challenge it phase this is where we really see reality this is where we can't stop for chats this is we're on it now you need a problem solve live the coach has to be in game rules but often he's going to make it more difficult. So poor ref calls the coach is going to do is, is going to know how a weakness of a player. So he's going to ask the opposition, can you do this to that athlete? So now we're really testing to see if we can break. Once that happens and we're successful, one, that builds confidence in the athletes. But secondly, it's a better test protocol, a baseline reality of how well have we done within this. And often when we start introducing this in teams, there's a breakdown, there's a failure very, very quick which is fine because another saying I use is we are where we are. We're ready when we're ready. So once we've identified that, we use another principle back on software or hardware. Where's the source of the breakdown? And we can involve athletes in this. Once we identify that, we go, right, do we need to go back in performance? Do we need to go back into the learn it or perform it? Or actually, can we now recognize it? Have we got a strategy to fix it and challenge it? And they can choose. They may be a minute in learn it and we may go back in to challenge it. But the sequences of the change understands everyone explicitly what the differences are. The coach understands their role, but also the athletes understand where they are on that journey. So in itself, that clears up a lot of the issues that a lot of coaches have. Does that make sense, Tim, in that explanation? I know it's been a quick one. Yeah, it does. And I, th I think a, a lesson here is just the, the communication that a coach has to have with their athletes to explain mm. why they're doing what they're doing as opposed to today we're doing this now everybody get on with it yeah there there is that process where they learn how this coach operates and the system that they're in so that they can recognize oh we are in the learn it we are in the perform it right now let's try to get to the challenge it and see if we can stop the coach from messing up our plans or whatever it may be and we, we, yeah, hundred percent, Tim. And we even do this with some of the young kids because they love the challenge it phase because they're competing against the coach. Mm -hmm. So actually, where some people think, "Oh, Mark, this might be a bit tough for young kids." No, 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 no. Don't underestimate the challenge young kids have. Now, if we're moving correctly, they will be ready. Although it will be stretch, and the reality is, you you will have lack of success in challenge it because. Yeah. In a match, you're not going to have 100%. So now we're getting athletes used to, 
also it's not going to be 100 percent success now it, the chances it will never be but what are we doing in the moment and are we committing are we making the right choice now i've got a review process that we teach with athletes from six seven years old up to pros to help them very quickly get to the source of an issue and the coach uses it as well to the source so then their language live on a pitch and a court can be not what the problem is what the solution is and then we have agreed words of meaning so when it's said live every athlete knows what's my role when someone says this so there's so much depth to it but the clarity as you said there tim we need clarity with every single athlete at any age. What is success for this phase of session? Which one are we in? They can then get involved in setting UAEs for where we are so they understand. They can let us know when they're ready. If you think you're ready to move on, you let me know. But make sure you're not just doing it for you. You need to do it for your whole team because it's a capability team. Unless we're working with a single athlete, then they can clearly say, I think I'm ready, coach. Yeah. Now, I'll... If you would talk a little bit about your your system, I know you wanted to to make an announcement about that as well, but explain a little bit of how how you operate, and maybe there's coaches out there who might be interested in in, in working with you. What does that look like? So the the two extremes, Tim, is someone gets me, and it's hundred percent organic. I go in, I seven days, I just watch, say nothing, like a little shadow. Um, and then from that, and they're still filming themselves, then we agree that this is what I'm seeing. Let's agree where the next stage is. And we go for a journey together, which is very organic, very bespoke. For everyone else, um, you know, sometimes challenges force you to do things you should have done years ago, Tim. How often does that happen? Mm -hmm. So for years, people were saying, Mark, why don't you put an online course together, an automated one where you can do tutorials, video examples? And I kept putting it off. COVID came and I was working with um, Cleveland Indios, Cleveland Cavaliers. No, it's Cleveland Guardians now, isn't it? Sorry for the name change, the baseball team. I flew back on the Friday and on the Monday, COVID locked down. So I basically lost all my work mm. for every team. And it was predominantly pro teams and American universities at the time. So it forced me to go, I need to put this online course together. So I, I basically ended up being around 100 hours of support of me going through all the steps, all the resources, all the trip ups, little solutions, video examples. And it's just grown now The the element within that now is it's over 150 hours. But I've now this is where the exclusive Tim for you. So no one knows about this yet. I've developed the 2.0, the 2.0. So from the feedback over the last couple of years, I'm taking it to another level now where it started on fundamentals. So what's happening now, and I've already started to add that into the members area, is I'm breaking down really super short tutorials from the problems some athletes have faced or coaches. So go fast track in and go, right, here's an element. And there's a peer set up. So if you're a member there and you're a coach in America, you can share and say, right, this is, this is where I am. I'd like to hook in with somebody. Someone else shares their details, could be in Canada, and then there's a process in the members area to show how to set up a peer support group, which could be a basketballer with a soccer coach mm -hmm. because they're developing, talking about software. It stops them talking about the tactics. So mm -hmm. that's really, really grown. Um, however, because that um, is continuing to grow, um, I'm sharing and I'll, I'll share it with you, Tim. The, there's a 50 percent off discount that no one knows about yet that with your people on here and that goes live tomorrow for everybody else so until 31st of may they can get into that but it's certainly the feedback i've had has been wow this is more than i thought but actually it's definitely helped coaches at grassroots or coaches that can't afford me or haven't got the time you know they're part-time whatever but it's it's a huge it's a monster in a nice way it's a cuddly monster <laughs> but all the things we speak about, Tim, one of the challenges I've always had with everybody is go, yeah, I get it, Mark, but how? You know, I hear a psychologist or I'm listening to a podcast and it all sounds great, but how? Where do I start? You know, contextually, what do I need to do? OK, well, I get this problem. This athlete I'm problem connecting with. This this athlete never says anything. Mm -hmm. This athlete's going in practice but can't do it in a match. Where do I go? So, it's really breaking down those solutions. The reality is, Tim, you still got to commit to it, but there is a change support process linked into the tutorials. So that's that's really been a bit of a passion project that's turned into 
I'd say 50% of my work now is online, mm -hmm. building that to answer the questions that people get. So the code, I believe, is I can share it, right? Yes, you can share it, yes. So the code you need is WINNER50, and it's a capital W, by the way. And that's that's good until when, May? 31st of May. 31st of May. So uh, if you go on Mark's website, I'm going to put it up here as well, which is pdscoaching.com. You can also connect with Mark at pdscoach. Uh, that's where I found him on social media. Um, you can go on their web that website, use the code WINNER50 and, and get that discount. So uh, Mark, one last question for me before, before I let you escape. You've seen a lot of coaches. You've worked with a lot of coaches. Uh, if you could give advice to two, maybe two or three things for coaches, uh, maybe they're you know, want, just wanting to improve as coaches, what, what would you offer them? Two things that you can do straight away, no cost apart from maybe even using your mobile phone, if that's the case, is record yourself coaching. Don't kid yourself. Just record yourself. Even if it's your voice, even if you can't get a camera, if you can get a camera, brilliant. And just watch it back, looking at how you're interacting, what you're saying. And from that, just identify. Now, even on my, um, there's a free area on my website that you don't even have to book into. Listen to some of the podcasts in there. And it will just take you through the basics of just saying, OK, so let me how do I look through this? And once you look for it, just pick one thing that you say, right, th if I could pick one thing that if I commit to the change is going to impact my coaching, then find it and just commit to it and commit to it for months if it needs. Don't think you need to change it every week. The second thing they can do is just find another coach to, sh to say in any sport to say, can we hook in? You know, can we support each other? And then you again it's just exploring then let's just agree that every week we just share our reflections on our work on let's agree that you know and we're going to do it on a friday by midday and um, my work on this what's your work on in itself what you've done there is you're no longer alone now i'm sharing it this way because then there are a lot of coaches that are on their own they turn up they've had a hard day's work you know they may be a parent and they turn up and they've got their cones their balls and off they've got to go again but doing those things is, is really going to give you a bit more purpose in understanding who you are how you coach if i was to add one um it would be identify your lighthouse identify you know, what is your purpose? What what type coach do you want to be? But what are you developing? Why are you turning up and doing doing this? What? How do you want to develop the people in front of you? Not in the moment, but in the next two, three years. And if it's if your goal is then, I want engagement, enjoyment, I want them to keep coming back, then make sure your purpose is that. How can I get skilled in that? If it's actually I'm being paid to get results, then you still need engagement, you still need enjoyment, which is slightly different than fun. But you still need the clarity of, OK, so what type of athlete do you need to develop? If you know you need to develop an athlete that needs to think for themselves, then you can't give them the answers all the time. So you understanding your lighthouse will give you a reference point to understand, well, how do I need a coach to develop the very athletes towards the lighthouse? So they would be my simple advice there, Tim. Oh, it's, it's great advice. Um, and I encourage anybody. Uh, if you have questions for Mark, whether you're listening or watching after this has been live, reach out to him with, with your questions. I, I know he'll be happy to answer. He was um, very supportive of doing this, uh, this interview with us. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. Just a reminder, everybody, if you are in the Florida area, June 15th this year, we will have the second annual coaches clinic that will be in Orlando, Florida. Or if you're not in Orlando or if you're not in Florida, feel free to come come uh, register and come hear some great speakers. I'm really excited about that. We're going away from Tallahassee this year down to Orlando. Um, but that's a wrap for us on behalf of myself, Tim Baghurst, and of course, Mark Bennett. Thank you all so much for watching.